Thanks so much for coming. Really appreciate the community support and being here with you. I'm Matthew Cruz. So I, I started um, studying Buddhism and Zen in 2006. And then in 2017, I started coming over here and uh, got to know Lama Jimpa. And in 2019, took refuge with him as my teacher. Um, so today's talk is um, about how to enter and listen to a teaching. Um, and so I think probably the best way to practice listening is, is meditation. So I'll do a short invocation and then we can sit for like six minutes together. Um, reverence to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. I bow down and go for refuge to the feet of the excellent holy Lama Yeshe Jimpa, who has great compassion. May the words I speak reflect this compassion and may my intention to be a source of help and liberation to all sentient beings.
And so the talk is in um, three parts. One is entering the, the Gampa. Two is how not to and how to listen to a teaching. And the third is a, a story uh, a friend um, mentioned that if um, people are gonna speak in front that they should probably go to like Toastmasters, learn how to be engaging. And so uh, I'm gonna try to do a, a story that I find is engaging um, for that purpose. Lama suggested I do a story about humble listening. So hopefully it's both. Um, so, you know, we primarily like have these um, normal secular lives um, where like we're all kind of, we all think we're on kind of the same page. The TV tells us what that page is. And then we all talk about it around the water cooler and we have jobs and we have these like expectations of behavior that everybody kind of like understands without talking about it too much. Um, so when we come here, um, we get to enter this space where all of a sudden there's like these new smells like incense and it's kind of like absorbed into all these different colorful fabrics and there's art all over the walls and weird things hanging down and statues and everything's a little bit different and instead of shaking hands people are doing this kind of stuff and there's bowing going on and so we're afforded the opportunity to um at least momentarily enter a space that helps us leave a secular or a material life behind and enter into a more spiritual way of being or something where um, that has more meaning to us, where um, our relationship with all things becomes very important. And uh, in Zen, they used to always say like uh, everything, every every thought, every emotion, every smell, every Thing you see every tree everything is uh, the whole universe conspiring for our awakening and so every every moment all of this has been created by masters artistic masters and um, you know usually there used to be music hopefully that'll be coming back soon I think Eli's learning some harmonium so and they're singing you know we do songs and prayers and these things that hopefully can um, instigate a little bit of shaking up that normal identity we have and that normal way of how we uh, go about our life into something so that we can start engaging in all the relationships differently. And I also like uh, Lama has been mentioning a lot like bowing as um, as being just like polite activity. Like I think as an American, it always seemed very like lowly, like I'm putting myself below whoever I'm bowing to. And um, so I really appreciated what he's been saying about, it, it kind of shows that even though we're entering this new kind of world where things are a little more loose and maybe getting shaken up for us a little bit, we still know how to be polite. And we know that somebody's coming to give a talk and other people are doing these activities and that you know there, there is still a little bit of um, polite structure between us. Uh, so moving on to how not to hear, um, this is this is taken from the um, commentary on the um, three principal aspects of the path by uh, Lama Tsongkhapa and the the commentaries by uh, Pabanka Rinpoche. Um, so it's the problems of the pot. This is um, known pretty well about how not to listen. So the the first problem with a pot is if the lid's closed. So in this scenario, we're the pot. And so if the lid's closed, that means we can't pay attention. We can't concentrate on what's being taught. And uh, what's generally talked about is there's three pillars in Buddhism. And so those pillars are what raise up our compassionate activity. And those are um, concentration, uh, wisdom, and ethical conduct. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about wisdom later, but we're trying to get to conduct. So those three pillars supposedly all kind of work together. We have to be working on all three to strengthen them. And like one lends itself to the other. So working with wisdom and ethics is what will help us with concentration. And when I say ethics in, in this way, like I don't 
necessarily wanting to get into prescribed ethics, um, but I like to think about it like in in moments where I'm most open and available to be tender and I don't feel threatened in any way, um, what is the right thing to do? And that spot that knows that because I'm in that space. Um, and so like staying in touch with that, because I think even if I have a list of ethics, that's very helpful. Um, but in the moment of things happening very quick, that list might not come. And so I want to have some other backup. And that's like, well, how do I practice that openness and staying in touch with that place in me that is naturally moral and naturally ethical? And uh, part of doing that, what gets in the way for me is I get, I get tight, you know? So like going throughout my day, um, if I, when I have made mistakes that I think are unethical, if I'm not in touch with that place, I'll start to have regret or um, get sad because I'm thinking I'm in the past thinking about them, right? And then I miss the opportunity in the present to be in that space. Likewise, um, when I'm carrying that kind of baggage, then what tends to happen is I start worrying about um, what the future will hold, if I'll be able to perform accurately or adequately, things like this, and I get anxious. So by spending time thinking about the future or spending time thinking about the past, I, I have a really hard time concentrating on the present. And so to combat these, um, the antidotes are generally to remember that um, this is, this, we have this precious human life right now. And um, we can think about all the benefits we have of this human life, the, of how effective we can be, the choices that we have, the high intellect that we have, the relationships that we have as a human, and that um, this is really precious. So we can really be happy. We can really grab onto that, and that's going to help us concentrate also. And um, I was thinking, like, if you don't believe in reincarnation, well, then this is it. This is the one. And if you do believe in reincarnation, then, you know, who knows when you'll be born a human again, if ever, right? This, again, could possibly be your last shot. I don't know how all that works, but so still a lot of importance. And then the other one that sometimes um, is a, seems a bit morbid, but I find it uh, really powerful and actually life affirming too, is that death is imminent. We all live like death is far away and, you know, we'll be old and all that. And we've got plenty of time to do all the stuff and to work on this stuff. Um, but actually it could happen at any time. And so living in this moment fully is super important. Um, so moving on, so that's concentration, the lid closed. Number two is a uh, pot full of grime. And so a pot full of grime is um, listening to the teaching with the wrong motivation, like wanting to, um, what's that, what's that say? a desire for a big reputation. So I guess that kind of works like this, like when you go to this teaching, I'm going to hear this guy like say these spiritual words and I'm, I'm like totally going to get it. And then I can go tell everybody all that I know about this spiritual stuff. And they're going to think I'm so great. And they're probably going to want to come to my house and give me money just so I can talk to them. And then I'm going to be rich and everybody's going to love me and it'll all work out. Um, and so what that's tied to is this thing called the eight worldly dharmas. And that is um, their corresponding mental states. And also uh, what we'll find when we internally investigate is that these are like thought patterns. Um, and so this is a generalized way to talk about a lot of the thought patterns that we have in our head. And so the first is pleasure. We're always seeking pleasure. We want to feel good, yummy food, good touch nice things to look at. And we want to avoid pain. We don't want to look at the homeless problem. We don't want to be hungry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second one is um, we're always trying to get things out of life. We want gain and we don't want to lose anything. And that creates this other uh, bad dichotomy because whenever I get something, now I'm really scared I'm going to lose it. And I have to develop all these ways. I have to start thinking about how to protect that. Um, and and that happens kind of with all of them too. And then there's um, praise and blame. So I'm always looking for people to play, praise me and tell me how great I am. But if somebody tells me I'm doing something wrong, I get really upset, even though clearly those two things have to work together and 
a lot of the teachings talk about like what's actually changed inside you like whether someone praises you or blames you for something has anything actually changed um, and i think that's different than looking at something like say corrective uh, criticism you know having a conversation with somebody we trust and they're helping us be better um, and then the last one is a good reputation or a bad reputation we're always trying to act in ways so that everybody can see us and we'll have a good reputation and then we're always worrying about well like what if what if they see this about me what if i do something wrong and then i have a bad reputation right that's that's also often said um recognition and obscurity so we don't we want all of the people at our funeral <laughs> we want them to be very sad that we're gone <laughs> you know and we definitely don't want that really quiet funeral um and so i think like in practicing for me um those things have become a real bear like it like really like all this stuff that's going on these neurotic thoughts like really can be categorized in one of these areas and um the more i started to see it it got really annoying and so i became very curious how to get away from that or how to get through that i think is more accurate and um just so happens that it's the exact same thing that Lama was like I was like well how do you listen to a teaching like what would you want me to talk about he's like well it's bodhicitta right and so bodhicitta is our wish for our own enlightenment for the sake of others right and it's when this becomes our primary aspiration that those eight worldly dharmas start to quiet down and so the more we train in how we want to be enlightened for the benefit of other beings those other things become secondary and start to quiet down. Lama also wanted me to um, make sure to remind everybody that bodhicitta is um, also right effort, that he sees them as very intertwined. And right effort means that we work for others, our outward things, 49% of the time, and 51% of our energy should go towards ourself. And that we really need to cultivate that wish for our own enlightenment and our own well-being. Um, and so as uh, in the Bodhisattva's way of life, it says, if people like these, like these is us. So if people like these have never before, even in the dreams they dream, felt such a wish for themselves, then how can it come to them for others? Um, so... In this tradition, we really believe in um, being good to ourselves and having that flow out. And uh, it's also said that, so that state of wanting to give up a worldly life and those worldly dharmas associated with it is called renunciation. And that actually that renunciation inwardly is the exact same state of mind as compassion turned outward. Um, so this leads me to, uh, it's kind of in the middle, there's one more pot, but I thought it went better after this. Like, well, how, how do we listen to a teaching? Um, so the, the commentary talks about um, that first we should think of ourselves as a patient for mental afflictions and desire make us ill. So we've kind of covered those eight worldly dharmas and how they make us suffer and and we can also think of suffering as there's suffering we can't get away from, and that's um, old age, sickness, and death. And these things are really important, but instead of like paying attention and having lives that are based on caring for ourselves and others around these issues and preparing for them, we get scared of them and develop an ego that um, keeps us from looking at them and leads us into distraction into all those other eight worldly dharmas, right? Um, and so that's the first arrow is the ones we can avoid. And then there's called a second arrow that actually is all the suffering that we mainly deal with. And it's stuff that is avoidable. So by that, we come to the second one. If that makes sense to you, and I do recommend that like you look at it, I think it's really logical and rational and I've investigated it myself. So now I have a lot of faith in that. And that leads to the second one that is think of the Dharma as medicine. So now I know, yes, I definitely suffer. I definitely believe that Dharma makes sense on how I can end the suffering and help others. 
And so then I would think of my teacher as a master physician. And so I took time to get to know this person over two years. I went to um, monthly darshans. I came around here a lot. I tried to chat him up and got to know him. And um, in that process, it, it became pretty clear that to me, he's a very safe person and that I could be open with him. I could be transparent with him and that, um, uh, that I was safe in doing that, that there weren't any, any reactions ever that I thought put me at danger or harmed me in any way. And um, so uh, with that in mind, um, that became pretty easy for me to say this is a master physician because I haven't really met that many people that are that safe uh, on that level, right? And I know that he's been training a long time uh, by working through um, books and stuff with him. I know that he's very intelligent. So I, I did that background work and I can say like, okay, this is a master physician. And so then fourth is think of following his teachings exactly and for long as needed in order to become well. And, uh, you know, I mean, what does it take to become well? I think a lot of people put in so much time and energy into um, like getting fit, losing weight, things like that. And like once they're determined, they're like on board, right? And I think it's just like, actually the one I've been thinking about a lot lately is doomsday preppers. Like, um, I find it, I'm a little bit fascinated right now because like they spend so much money, time and effort in learning all these skills, putting everything together, like setting everything up. And I just wonder like, if, what if you did all that for like, dealing with right now like instead of worrying about when things collapse like let's worry about like keeping things going and maybe even getting better you know so I, I think we have the time and energy in a lot of ways but um I think this is saying that hey we should look at this like our own well-being and the well-being of our community should be where we're putting our our time and effort and then five uh, think of the Buddha as infallible or your teacher as Buddha. Um, this one I see is um, being really important for a couple reasons. One, I can actually let go quite a bit. Like a lot of my thinking has to do with my way or the highway and consuming myself with that. And so if I've already developed that relationship, I've already decided this man knows what he's doing and is a safe person. I can let go of it. I can, it gives me the opportunity to relax. You know, I also spend a lot of time judging others and um, being pessimistic. And so what would happen if, right? I mean, I kind of know what's happened for me, but like, I ask you, like, you know, what would happen for you if you suspended that judgment and allowed someone to be the Buddha, you know, as infallible and began to see them in that way? And, and my experience has been that um, he's been very good at reflecting back to me when I'm being like that to myself, both when I'm being judgmental and pessimistic towards myself and when I'm in that spot I was talking about earlier where I'm open, tender, and I, I really know what's right for me ethically and morally. And that I think it's holding people in that regard that begin to create that relationship with myself. Um, and then six is pray that this great cure, the teachings of the Buddhas, may remain long in this world. And I mean, I think, right, if we've been suffering and we start to find that our suffering is decreasing and that we're getting well, like we want that for others. And we want that in our communities. We want that to continue in this world. And so it's a, a great prayer. So that's uh, the six steps to how we should listen to a teaching. And then the, the last one of the problem of the pot, how not to listen, is a pot with the bottom falling out. And um, so that means we can't retain the teachings. We just forget, right? And so the recommendation is um, that's why we need Sangha. So it's recommended that after a teaching, we get together, we go in the back for snacks, and then we talk about what we heard and like reinforce what the teacher said with each other and discuss how that could work in our life and things like that so that we can actually put the teachings into practice. Um, I think that uh, covers 
pronunciation, bodhicitta, and refuge also. And then the um, last part of my talk is a, it's a Zen story. And uh, so before I say this, Lama uh, wanted me to say that, uh, to remember this actually isn't a monarchy and uh, it's a training ground for Buddhas. And so a lot of you are very familiar faces. So I know you're all training to be Buddhas too. And the Lama says, um, we don't heal people by laying on hands, which that's a body worker. I'm like, mm. <laughs> but I get it. And we don't wash away sins with water. Instead, we teach. And so we all get the opportunity to practice coming up here and teaching. And um, you know, also hopefully um, doing that together as friends, which is, you know, Maitreya. Maitreya is known as uh, friendship Buddha. So I often think of Maitreya maybe as like coming into realization as Sangha, as friendship. And that's where enlightenment will happen in the future. Um, so the story, so feudal Japan, uh, samurai were like just under royalty. And so they were the only ones allowed to carry a long sword. Everybody else could only carry a short sword. They had short sword and long sword. And they could also kill people on the street with impunity. I mean, there was no judge, jury, none of that stuff. They could make up that decision right there and then, right? So very powerful people in society. And this one rather large prefecture, the head samurai, big guy, he heard of this very famous monk that was traveling about and coming to town. And uh, this monk was highly, highly regarded, great, great teacher. And so he wanted to set up um, a private meeting with him. And of course, private meeting meant they got to talk and then there were like retinues for both of them in the room around them, right? It was a whole like ordeal. And uh, the samurai was a pretty proud guy, you know, uh, he had an image to protect. And uh, so he uh, was late to the meeting that got set up because, of course, you know, it's his town, it's his venue. He's not going to be left waiting around. So he came in and the monk was talking and the, um, with some of his retinue and the, the monk didn't like initially turn and recognize the samurai. And so the samurai kind of makes a show of it and is like, monk, monk. Why don't you teach me the secrets of heaven and hell? And, and the monk turns to him very politely and bows to him and says, why would I waste my breath on an oaf like you who can never possibly understand it? And the samurai, you know, his eyes are popping out. He reaches for his sword and he's like, no, 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 I can't do that. And the monk says, aha, this is hell. And he goes, oh, right? He was lost in it, totally in anger. So the samurai gets on one knee and humbly bows to the, the monk and says, oh, thank you so much for that teaching. You're clearly a great teacher. I really appreciate it. And the monk says, ah, oh, and this is heaven. Hmm. Um, so I, I love that story. Um, it's fun to tell. Uh, I think what's really interesting to me right now, though, is that um, the wisdom and compassion that were allowed to arise in that story were not the work of any one person. The monk had to stay in compassion and actually he was a little, he was, he was probably acting wise, right? He was being pretty clever in how he dealt with that. But the samurai also had to be open to listening, even in his rage. He was ready to be in that moment and be changed in that moment by what was going on and then respond accordingly. <clears throat> And so um, the, what's interesting, that's that thing that compassion and wisdom don't belong in a vacuum, don't belong singularly. You know, they, it comes about in this larger context of everything working together. 
um, when when that's what's important to us. So to conclude by practicing these three paths and keeping ourselves in a state of continually listening, the occurrence of blissful wisdom may blossom as if in a perpetual spring, morning grass wet with dharma and the afternoons permeated by the fragrance of its benefit. Please practice diligently and may our benefits, our efforts be of benefit to all. Thank you. Are there any questions? You should have been. Thanks, Matthew. You packed a lot <laughs> into a very short time. I'm going to have to listen to that one again. Really, there was a lot in there. Thank you so much. You had six steps or six approaches to listening. Ways to listen. Yeah. Could you, you just sort of summarize those again for me? I can read them. Um, think of yourself as a patient for mental afflictions and desires make you ill. Think of Dharma as the medicine. Think of your teacher as a master physician. Think of following his teachings exactly and for long as needed in order to become well. Think of the Buddha as infallible or your teacher as the Buddha. And then pray that this great cure, the teachings of the Buddhas, may remain long in the world. Thank you. This is from uh, Pabunka from um, Liberation in the Palm of Hand, or what? From uh, Tsongkhapa, the three aspects of the path. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, I'll take a quick moment to introduce myself. My name is Kent Gray. This is uh, my second time here. Okay. I was here about three weeks ago, um, but I have been um, pursuing the Dharma for a number of years. Um, so I kind of actually want to share a couple of things. Um, one's just kind of on the, the subject of listening, because I was just reminded. I actually keep a sign that is actually in my office behind where people are sitting across from me. So it's always in my eyesight. And it has on it two things about listening. Um, one I share very regularly, which is uh, most people don't listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. And I work very hard to be understanding in my listening and then go forward from there. Um, you can be far more helpful and effective in those areas, because it's the difference between listening and hearing. We hear passively. That's why when something goes bump in the night, we wake up. Um, the other one is, uh, and this is actually from the famous actor, Alan Alda, is uh, listening is being open to being changed by the other person, which I think goes so wonderful with your story of the, the samurai. Um, and I just wanted, finally, the main thing was to speak, you were talking about loss you know, it's the two sides that, you know, the loss, you know, first we see gain and then we worry about the loss. And I'm always reminded as I, as I practice and, and go further in that in the end, I, I don't, is to let go of that fear because it will happen. We will lose mm -hmm. our life will in this conscious, my consciousness will continue on. Um, but the identity of who Kent Gray is at the moment and all the worldly beings. And so the diet and the exercise and everything like that is tangent, transitional. Ah, I can't speak today. Sorry. <laughs> but transitional. That, you know, that, that, you know, we do spend a lot of time worrying about that, which is a very good point. But the reality is we're worrying about something as inevitable as, our own death mm -hmm. at the end. And it was the Buddha who said, you know, one of the most important meditations that we can meditate on 
is our own death. So just kind of wanted to share. Yeah, I appreciate it. I know um, in a in another life, I was an attorney. And, and uh, so that was like very much I needed to respond and I needed to respond correctly. And it took me a while um, after leaving law to um, actually admit to ever being confused. That was something I was not allowed to be. And um, it was it was in that admitting that I was confused and beginning to understand what confusion felt like in my body that I think I was able to start listening to others because I had to both allow myself to be confused by something that was said to me and trust myself that I could come out of the confusion. Yeah, right, things become clear. Anyone online? I think that's a hand. Evan? No, that's my hand. Excuse me. <laughs> Confusion. <laughs> um, you said something about renunciation being inside. And compassion. Let me see. <laughs> you said something about compassion being in, or no, renunciation inside, compassion outside. It's not a, not a screen door. Huh. <laughs> um, is it a screen door out? Oh. What the reading was saying was actually that it's the same state. The renunciation and compassion are the same state of being. That renunciation is um, renouncing uh, a worldly life. And so that's the greatest compassion that we can have for ourselves, basically. And so renouncing internally is the same as compassion outwardly. Or like uh, when I asked Lama several years ago what I needed to know about uh, renunciation, he was like, it's anything that keeps you from this moment. All right, we should do prayers. So uh, as soon as the screen, there you go. Um, yeah, as soon as the uh, dedications displayed, I'll, I'll start it. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rizik, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. So uh, JD was going to make an announcement. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that um, 
donations are always welcome and they help keep the lights on, doors open, food uh, for our pujas, <laughs> you know, and all of that is greatly appreciated. And it doesn't have to be a huge amount of money, although we welcome that. <laughs> But just, uh, you know, whatever you can contribute is greatly appreciated. And it goes where? Oh, oh there's a box uh, as you leave. And also, um, it's done. also in the, uh, in the kind of a little uh, library area, there's, there's some sheets if you want to be on our mailing list, if you'd like, and you haven't signed up. And if you'd like to, there's a little sign up where you can just put your email. And that just tells you what's going on each week, which is a lot, you know. So, so that's it. That's it. Do you have any announcements? Or something? <laughs> oh, online. Uh, well, if you go to the Lions Road Dharma Center website, which is um, just Lions Road Dharma Center, it'll, it'll pop up a website. And then on the home page is a, a little button. It's pretty prominent for donations that people can do. So, uh, we're just talking about something really practical right now, but practically speaking, uh, the most important thing is all of us being together here, but to have this really wonderful space that we haven't always had, we all have worked hard together, some of us a whole whole lot, and some of us, um, just whatever we can, we, we're able to uh, keep this space so people can visit us and so that people like, our, like Matthew can give talks. It's so nice to have a space of our own. Never take it for granted. Oh, and there's a friend in the back uh, that wants to say one more thing, Elizabeth. I'm going to run in the uh, Thanksgiving Day run for the hungry. And I'd like to see um, the rest of us come out, walk, and run, and raise money for people who need help eating. It's a big deal right now, and uh, we can walk, and we can run long distances, and we can do both. So I'd like to see everybody come out and do whatever they can do um, on that day. We can all be together, and maybe we can put together a T-shirt or something. It's on Thanksgiving Day, so it'll be early morning Thanksgiving. I will. I will. I, I can't. I, I fell down <laughs> on both knees in two separate occasions, so I can't decide whether I'm going to walk or run. Uh, so I should be able to decide that next week, <laughs> how bad the pain is or not. Um, and I'll set it up, and I'll make sure that Patty puts it in the um, in the newsletter. And uh, Elizabeth's announcement reminds me of a Sangha friend here uh, that Autumn, Autumn is doing something amazing on um, October 20th at the Crocker Art Museum. Autumn's a professional uh, visual artist and she is going to have a, uh, it's called, uh, maybe Autumn has to help me. It's called Farm. Do you know? Uh, well, it's called The Biggest Little Farm. And so if you're available on Thursday, that would be just so fun to go to the Crocker and see Autumn and see all her work. And uh, she's there for a reason. She's so amazing. So I just want to mention her. Uh, and that's on Thursday, October 20th. And uh, next Saturday from 9 to 11, there's going to be a garden party. And by that, I mean, we will do some work in the garden <laughs> together with a... <laughs> oh, Patty's going to bring cookies. Thank you. And apple spice donuts. <laughs> it's going to be great. So we'll definitely have a party attitude. Uh, it's only a couple hours. There, please take some time after to walk around um, and see all the beauty out there. Um, there's not a lot that needs to be done, but it's kind of that time of year to clean it all up and put it to bed for the winter. So if you care to join, would be much appreciated. Love to see you. Thank you again for coming today. Bye, online friends. Thank you, Matthew. Great talk.
Bye all. Thank you, Matthew. Bye. Thank you, Matthew. See y'all.